Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Nancy Ahrens with Scott Insurance out of Richmond, Virginia. And I wanna welcome all that are on board and it looks like the numbers continue to grow and people are joining in. Um, I wanted to start this morning with giving a short bio on our, uh, our, our, our panel this morning. And um, bear with me, because we have a lot of accomplishments here to, to read off. So I've got, give me about two or three minutes. We'll start with Neil Began with Cherry Beckert. Neil is a principal in the Risk and Accounting Advisory Services Group of Cherry Beckert. Neil is responsible for leading the firm's IT audit group based in Washington, DC, has been serving clients since 2000 in the areas of IT audit, consulting, privacy, and compliance, and oversees co-sourced internal audit projects for businesses and nonprofit organizations, as well as audit and consulting projects for the public and private sector. Amongst his many professional designations, I'm going to cut right to the one that's most pertinent of this morning, where Neil was recently certified as one of the first CMMC provisional assessors in the country. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Neil. Russ Cohen with the Chubb is Vice President of Cyber Services. Russ serves as Vice President and Cyber and Technology Practice Leader at Chubb, where he helps policyholders analyze cyber exposures and respond to cyber events when they occur. He drives innovations within cyber underwriting, claims, and data analytics disciplines. Russ has more than 16 years of cybersecurity and technology experience in a variety of roles, including an ethical white hat hacker. He holds a CISSP certification and is an active member of various security organizations, including InfraGuard and ICS. Good morning, Russ, and thank you for joining. Kate Growley with Kroll and Mooring. Kate is a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Kroll and Mooring. She is a member of the steering committee for the firm's privacy and cybersecurity group while working closely with the firm's government contracts and litigation groups. Her practice covers a wide range of information security counseling and litigation engagements with a particular emphasis on the government contracting community. Kate's work regularly includes cybersecurity and supply chain compliance, digital transformation, incident response, cybersecurity audits, and investigations and disputes surrounding data breaches and trade secrets. Kate is a certified information privacy professional for both the US private and government sectors with the International Association of Privacy Professionals. She is also a registered practitioner with the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification Accreditation Body. She has been recognized by Chambers USA and Chambers Global and named a rising star by both Law 360 and the American Bar Association's Science and Technology section. Welcome, Kate, and thank you for joining. And we have Trey Warman, Vice President, Executive United Underwriting Specialist. Trey has over 30 years experience in the cyberspace, 20 years of service with Chubb, including errors and omissions and cyber liability. At Chubb, Trey underwrites property and liability insurance, including E&O and cyber liability. His area of specialization is underwriting property and casualty insurance for US federal contractors in professional services, technology, aviation, facility support, miscellaneous services, and manufacturing, predominantly for defense and intelligence agency. He has received his BS in Management and Marketing from Ithaca College, and Trey obtained his CPCU in 1992. So I welcome this panel, a high-powered, very, very experienced in CMMC, and I'm gonna pass it to Neil for a few housekeeping items. Thank you, Nancy, really appreciate it. Thank you also to the panelists joining us today, as well as Scott Chubb and Jerry Becker for hosting this. Um, just a couple housekeeping items. We are obviously doing this completely virtual. When we set out to have this panel several months ago, the hope was that we were going to return to in person. Uh, so forgive us as we kind of are, are doing a virtual panel here. I myself am sharing a screen. 
So I've asked the other panelists to feel free to uh, interrupt me if need be because I'm not able to see their faces as well as you are. Um, from a housekeeping standpoint, we do want to be able to utilize the chat function, uh, which is um, provided to you through the GoToWebinar links on the right side of your page. Feel free to type in uh, any questions there as they relate to the panelists and or the discussion today. Um, it's possible that they may be able to be answered real time as part of the presentation, that they may be able to be answered in the chat, or uh, any that we do not get to, we will follow up afterwards. Uh, these slides today, because we are doing a virtual panel, we are going to put the actual questions up that we will be addressing throughout. Does not mean we will not get off topic. In fact, I fully expect that we will. Um, but the questions will be up there. Uh, in addition, at the end, we will also include contact inf information for the panelists as well as resources. Um, from an assumption standpoint, the assumption now is we're sitting here in October 2021 that everyone here knows what CMMC is, uh, knows what's behind it, kind of some of the players involved that will be referenced uh, today during the panel. If for some reason you don't, that's okay. Some of the resources that we list at the end are a great starting point. Uh, including podcasts and so forth. Um, and really, with that said, if we kind of walk through this agenda, we did at least want to take a pause to talk about what was projected uh, about 10 months ago from the DOD and really the uh, the accreditation body versus where we are today. Um, and then kind of jump into the panel discussion. If you think about even the title of this panel and, and, and this session today is, are they really going to be required? Again, when we came up with that title months ago, we were thinking a lot of things were going to be in play that, quite frankly, we'll dig into in a second, haven't amounted to as much as we thought. Um, so we're going to talk about things such as legal impl implications, insurance implications, readiness considerations as you are uh, looking at uh, preparing your organization for CMMC, uh, do a little sneak peek into what we think is coming next. And then if there's time at the end, open it up uh, to Q&A. Again, these could be coming out of the chat or otherwise. So with that said, this was kind of the projected state. We go back to January of 2021. And for any of us who have worked in and around the federal government, when you hear notional, obviously that's best case scenario. And I think we all knew that at this time. But if you look at kind of this notional timeline that they were presenting back in uh, late January, early February. Um, you can see across the top of you know, the government's um, milestones in terms of kicking off the pilots and issuing RFPs and awarding contracts. And then on the bottom in the yellow is really what the, uh, the, the DIB, the Defense Industrial Base, was going to be accountable for, and that was preparing for and ultimately going through certifications uh, in order to accept the award. Um, so if you can kind of look at where they thought they were going to be in April, issuing RFPs, that didn't happen. We look where they thought they were going to be issuing this, um, the initial contracts in August, that didn't happen. And certainly, along with that, while a lot of the readiness and preparedness has, has come along, um, there have been no certifications to date. There's some big reasons for that. Think about where we are now in October, in the actual state, is that the CMMC rule is still not final. Um, this is not to be confused with the executive order that was released by the Biden administration back in May. Uh, but the CMMC rule, again, still not final. It's issued an in interim um, a little under a year ago, still out for comment. There was some thought, I know even some discussions with eight of the panelists, um, you know, as this year went on, that we thought um, that it may get issued by the end of the fiscal year. That too did not happen. Uh, so something to, to consider when you're talking about CMMC is that the rule is still not final. There was a very, very large uh, change in leadership at the DOD. Many of you may be aware of Katie Arrington, um, really kind of considered the godmother of CMMC, even came up with the name, was, was heavy, heavy on the um, public speaking uh, scene over the last two years, kind of evangelizing the need um, and, and the, and the uh, overall program itself. She was replaced with uh, Jesse Salazar, um, and who really has been tasked with leading CMMC through to fruition and through potentially uh, some significant modifications that we'll talk about today. Uh, one of the things, and Kate, from a lawyer standpoint, I, I kind of defer to you. I always say I'm not a lawyer, but if you think about something like this, that Arrington was removed amid investigations into ties um, to the CMC accreditation board, there was also, uh, I think, a, a accusation of a potential leak of all things classified information 
again, from a, a lawyer standpoint, I try and stay away from anything legal, but anything to touch on uh, from the Katie Arrington situation here? Yeah, I just add she's she's on administrative leave. There are a couple investigations that are ongoing, but the practical takeaway for this audience is exactly what you said, Neil. Um, Mr. Salazar is now leading the charge, um, and he's going to be responsible for that messaging that Ms. Arrington had been so forthcoming with. Absolutely. Um, and then the other thing that that we did want to kind of, you know, exercise a little bit of candor here in terms of perception. Um, you know that this program itself because of the impact uh, that it has across hundreds of thousands of organizations um, and quite frankly those that can support those as well um, it, it, it's been viewed under a microscope by many and oftentimes what you end up reading about in the papers are the more salacious articles whether it be tied to katie Arrington or in this case complaints about the ab uh, the AB, again, the independent body that, that was set up as a not-for-profit to sit between the DOD and industry. Um, there's been multiple allegations against uh, different board members, um, including, you know, um, ethical violations, SEP dealing, um, you know, controlling which our set assessors are becoming certified more than others. So a lot of kind of the new administration, and there has been uh, a considerable amount of turnover even at the AB, uh, has been tasked with really right-sizing that ship and, and um, you know, getting the house back in order and even improving upon that appearance and that uh, perception on the marketplace. So we talked about the program uh, itself, CMMC, being under internal review since March. Um, th there's kind of three focuses here. One is a focus on managing the cost for small businesses. You've seen since March, even testimony and so forth. Um, and a lot of focus being in around small and medium businesses, which I think, and I think the other panelists may agree, is probably um, contributing significantly to the delays in this rule becoming final because there's so much to work out there. Uh, clarifying the regulatory policy and contracting requirements. And then, as I mentioned, kind of reinforcing trust and confidence in the ecosystem. I won't read it to you here, but you can see it on the screen, kind of a, a quote from Jesse Salazar, who again replaced Katie Arrington. Um, and kind of what he's been tasked with and his goals for the program. And then the last thing, which again, we include a link to from a resource perspective, um, is something called Project uh, Spectrum, which has been set up and managed by the DOD's Office of Small Business Programs. So with that said, we want to kind of jump into the panel. We're going to start with a legal questions, Kate, so I'm going to pick on you. Um, this is some confusion um, in and around CMMC and as it relates to uh, kind of adjacent compliance areas from the FAR or even DFAR. So question uh, leading off today is what is the difference between what CMMC requires versus the current FAR and DFAR cybersecurity requirements? Yeah, thanks Neil. And it's a great question and a really important foundational one. Um, so CMMC, again, we're kind of assuming some sort of baseline understanding, but at a high level, it's basically saying that depending on the sensitivity of the information that you might be handling under future contracts, you'll need to get a third party to come in and certify that you've met a corresponding set of cybersecurity requirements. Um, and of course, the response to that is, well, aren't I already meeting certain cybersecurity requirements under my current? contractual terms? And the answer is yes, but the process, the way that the DOD is going to go about verifying that you are indeed meeting those requirements, that's what's going to look a little different under CMMC. So currently, there's something called the FAR Basic Safeguarding Clause. It's going to be included in every single contract, not just DOD contracts, because it's a FAR clause. And it says that when you handle essentially any information in the performance of a contract that's not publicly available or not sort of that simple transactional information that's just necessary to do your back-end invoicing, that sort of information, when it sits on your own network, that network needs to have 17 really basic security controls in place. And importantly, a distinction between the FAR requirements and what we're going to talk about with the DFARs, DOD-specific requirements, those 17 basic controls, they need to be implemented at the time of award. So there's really no uh, grace period, if you will, to go ahead and roll out those requirements. 
that's a little different from what we have currently under a DFARS clause that's been around for a while. We often refer to it as a 7012 clause. It's a DFARS 252.204-7012. And that says that when you handle a specific type of DOD information, what normally now we refer to as DOD controlled unclassified information, that's CUI, then you need to work towards implementing 93 additional controls. So you've got the 17 controls that you're already subject to under the FAR, and then you've got 93 more. All of those controls are pulled from a NIST standard called NIST Special Publication 800-171. There's 110 in total, so you've got the 17 plus the 93. Now, the nice thing about the 7012 clause is that you actually don't have to have all 110 of those controls fully rolled out with the exception of those 17 basic ones under the FAR clause. Instead, you have to basically do some documentation to show that it's a matter of when, but not if, you're gonna have those 110 controls fully implemented. That document is gonna start with a system security plan. It's gonna describe what your network looks like and how you have implemented the controls you've already done. And then for those that you haven't yet done or you haven't yet completed, you're gonna have a POAM. That's a plan of action and milestones. And it basically says, this is my plan of action. This is what I am planning on doing to fill the gap. And here's my milestone. Here's my timeline by which I expect to do it. So when you bid on a contract that includes this 7012 clause, you are self-certifying that you have those documents in place. You have your SSP and you have your POAM, and you're going to work towards fully implementing those 110 controls. Now, what was interesting with the interim rule that Neil talked about, where CMMC was first formally introduced, we also saw the DOD propose a bit of an interim step that we're seeing get incorporated into contracts right now. And those are through DFARS clauses at 7019 and 7020. So the same site as that 7012 clause that we talked about, just the different four digits at the end. So here, the idea is that You've got your requirements to have your SSP and your POAM. You've self-certified when you bid on the contract that you've got those in place. The 7019 and 7020 clauses, that requires you to calculate how much you have done in implementing those 110 controls. There's a specific DOD scoring rubric that you will use. You will get a score as a result of it. And in order to be eligible, for either a prime or a subcontract that includes those clauses in it, you have to submit that score before you can be eligible for award. And importantly, you are not permitted to calculate a score without a formal SSP. So again, the idea isn't that you're gonna get dinged if you have a lot of gaps, if you have a lot of poems, but it's a pseudo indirect verification mechanism from the DOD's perspective to ensure that you've been doing what you were supposed to do under 7012. Again, that SSP and the POAM. So now that brings us to CMMC, uh, the formal DFARS clause that we have there. Again, same beginning citation, just the last four digits are a little different. DFARS 252.204-7021. This is the big thing that all of these 7012, 7020 clauses are rolling up into. So here's how CMMC is a little different, and I'm gonna focus on level three because level three of CMMC is going to be the minimum level required to handle that DOD CUI that is the focus of those other DFARS clauses that I just mentioned. So under CMMC, you're gonna to have to focus on all of those 110 controls that are in that NIST standard, again, that you're already thinking about, but there's gonna be an additional 20 controls that are brand new. They're pulled thematically for some other pre-existing standards, but a lot of them, the DOD has created for the first time and they're really tailored towards their objectives with CMMC. So you've got 110 plus an additional 20 new controls. The other difference is that historically, the DOD has been focused on just are you getting the job done? We don't care how messy it is. We don't care how well institutionalized it is. You don't necessarily need all of the policies and procedures, all the trappings around it. We just wanna make sure that you're actually implementing those controls. That's a big difference between historically what your cybersecurity requirements have been and what CMMC focuses on now. CMMC says when we have that third party assessor, the C3PAO come in and take a look at what you're doing, they're going to look at actually have you implemented those controls, but also how well have you done that? 
how institutionalized is this such that we can be sure that yes, you're doing those practices today, but can we be confident that you're gonna be doing that next month, next year, even several years down the road? That's a really big difference. And then the third really significant difference is that there are no POEMs allowed under CMMC. So again, 7012, right now you're just focused on the documentation. It's okay if you have some work to do. When that C3PAO comes in and does an assessment under CMMC, you need to make sure that you have all 130 of those practices fully rolled out and the maturity processes associated with them fully implemented. Otherwise, you won't get certified at the necessary level. So we're just scratching the surface here, but those are kind of the high points of how CMMC looks different from what you all have probably been thinking about up until now. Yeah, scratching the surface is right. And Kate, you did the exact perfect thing in an IT presentation by using a lot of acronyms and numbers, so. It's for... government and IT, we can't avoid it. <laughs> That's absolutely right. And and uh, yeah, to, to kind of sum up um, what Kate said, you know, if you think about the self-assessment process um, that was around um, because of 7012 back in 2017, I think we can all agree that it, we realized that self-assessments, as most, um, aren't always the most robust. And so this thought of getting rid of what is considered to be the perpetual poem of continually kicking the can down the road um, brought about this need for CMMC and this, this third party assessment. So some of the ones that she mentioned uh, 70, 19, 20, and 21, um, you know, incorporate in those requirements, even submitting the scores she mentioned into the supplier performance risk system, otherwise known as SPURS, where you do talk about when you will be uh, meeting a perfect score of 110, really leading its way into what will ultimately be with, with, with CMMC, that's 70, 21. So, Kate, that was, that was a absolutely perfect, perfect descriptive uh, answer to that question, so I appreciate it. Let's shift a little bit and, and go to the insurance side of the house. I'm going to ask Trey to kind of lead uh, this first question, what is, uh, which is, what should clients and policyholders expect from their cyber insurance carrier? Obviously, when you start talking about a cyber standard and talking about what is intended to do in terms of uh, mitigate or reduce the, the uh, probability of a breach, the, the, you know, the, the reality is that these things do happen. So can you talk about it a little bit from uh, the insurance side of the house? Sure. So thanks. I'll start with the background. I'll give a couple examples and then I'll bring Russ in because Russ specializes in cyber services, which is really an important part of the process. So the background is, is this. We're, we're in kind of a perfect storm right now when it comes to cyber claims. Uh, looking back to 9-11, the property market was really disrupted when the towers came down. Rates went up a, a lot. Capacity came into question. What, what insurance companies can provide what? Uh, and some companies really had some significant financial hits. We're, we're kind of there now with, with cyber. So, and the cyber coverage has morphed over years. It started out when we did this 25 years ago, we started off with banking and financial services only for uh, digital online events and money transfer things. And then uh, for in the tech world, we did a lot of uh, intellectual property infringement coverage, like software code infringement. And that kind of morphed over time to what we have today today. Uh, and for government contractors, there, there are two different products. You can buy cyber, just kind of standalone, a cyber policy for digital events that happen. Or if you're technology focused, you'll have errors and emissions and cyber together because they kind of are interconnected in, in some ways. Now, what's happened with um, malware and malicious attacks is significant. Our, our CEO, when he did our quarterly earnings, mentioned that we are uh, the largest or one of the largest cyber uh, insurers in the world, Chubb, Chubb is, and so it was mentioned to our investors, you know, kind of, kind of what, what's happening, is systemic losses, widespread events, so the, the scenario is this, think of a K&R policy, you have ransom coverage, and you have one person is, is, is uh, kidnapped, and you have one claim. That's easy to cover on a policy. Now think about, like, a, a, let's say, a robot going out and kidnapping thousands of people at the same time and all these claims paying out across 
uh, even countries and nations. That's where we are. Uh, I, I think the NotPetya virus was a perfect example where, where it started in the Ukraine, uh, allegedly from a Russia hacker, malware was spread, uh, computers were destroyed, physical damage. So it's gotten to be so significant that some small carriers now are paying out in extortion claims and other types of losses because the policies cover both network extortion, first party expenses like loss of data, uh, and then a variety of images and defense coverage uh, services that are provided. So there's a myriad of coverages that are offered. Some carriers are paying out 60 cents on the dollar in, in claims right now. So the response has been horrific for the buyers. Uh, retentions are going up, limits are coming down. Most carriers are capping their limits at like $5 million, whereas you know, years ago, we might be $25 million. So you now you have to buy a fragmented program if you wanna buy limits. Uh, retentions are going up. So what what should you expect? Uh, from, as a buyer, you want an experienced financial, uh, financially stable market. So, so the, some of the smaller carriers, uh, although they were very attractive initially, uh, some of them have been forced to sell to, to larger companies. Some at some point could decide to get out of the cyber business and, and not, not handle it anymore. So you want an experienced stable market, AM best ratings of, of a, uh, a, a plus is good. And you might want to ask how many cyber claims does your company handle a, a month? Um, it, what kind of frequency do you have? Because experience is going to be really important if you have an event. It can impact your reputation as a federal government contractor. Another uh, consideration would be ability to, to soften rate increases across the line. So if you go with a carrier that, that uh, doesn't just do cyber insurance, but they're also your provider for general liability, property insurance, and workers' compensation, some of those lines are pretty profitable. So if I'm, an, as an underwriter, have to increase your cyber rates significantly, I can look to areas like, let's say, general liability, where the experience is extremely profitable for federal government contractors. And maybe I back off a little bit on that person, soften the blow. Uh, so that's important as well, uh, multiple lines, and then uh, access to uh, data. Uh, so we have, we have a site that uh, you can look at, it's, it's in the resources section here. If you Google Chubb Cyber Index, C-H-U-B-B Cyber Index, or type in chubbcyberindex.com, again, it's in the resources, you'll look at the, the big data that we have. And we're, we're sharing this with, with, with anybody who wants to see it online. It's a public site, you don't have to see it. But again, with hundreds and hundreds of claims processed each month, it's, it's interesting and um, valuable, I think, for you to see inside attacks, outside attacks, where are they coming from? Uh, first party ex expenses uh, versus third party defense dollars. All that information is contained and you can you can sort it by industry. So in our federal government contracting practice, we, to get into our segment or the, the segment specialty that Chubb has, which is really, really unique, it's all about who they uh, they uh, who their customer is. In other words, they, they sell, you sell to the government as a prime or a subcontractor. Uh, so when you do use this tool, though, you're going to have to go by what you do, like wholesaler, distributor, technology company. Then you look at size, and you can look at the cyber in, uh, uh, incidents that are impacting those companies. It'll help you in your uh, buying decision uh, as far as uh, types of coverage and, and limits. Um, and lastly, uh, you want a carrier that has really good access to skilled vendors. And, and I'm going to let Russ take, take over here and talk about both breach and post-breach. Before a loss happens, what you can do, access to tools and training, and then after a loss happens, that's Russ's area. Russ, can you expand on that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So one of the things that is unique about cyber insurance and what I've learned going from being the global security architect with inside of Chubb's own information security department over to where I am now is we look at companies in 10 to 12 month blocks. Whereas information security departments and these companies trying to implement these controls, they have more time. There's not really a specific time limit that I know there's urgency for them getting all these controls implemented, but from a larger organization or any organization, they have more time to implement these security controls. But from a cyber insurance perspective, if a policy binds in January and there are some controls that were deficient, 
waiting eight months before those controls are implemented, that's a long period of time from, from, a, from a cyber insurance perspective. So what's really, really, really important and what you should be asking your cyber insurance carrier is helping you prioritize what they should be doing, not just you know, before binding happens, but also what can they start doing immediately after binding to improve their risk. So, you know, Kate, you brought up you know, great numbers with 17 controls that are, that are prioritized by um, far, and then 93 more, right? That's a lot of controls for someone to implement in a short period of time, for any company to implement in a short period of time. So using data that we have, the claims experience, it's, we've gotten it down to six, right? So really trying to help companies prioritize so that they can get these controls implemented as quickly as possible. And things like incident response is one of the top items that are one of the controls that most cyber insurance companies are gonna want their clients to be working on. Being able to get access to those resources that whether it's forensics, whether it's legal resources, whether it's notification, all those resources need to be there at the ready when something happens, as a, not as opposed to, but really before all the incident response plans, which you know, CMMC has requirements for, but we would rather see someone know what the 800 number to call when something happens versus prioritizing having a full-blown incident response plan. Both are important, but from a cyber insurance carrier perspective, we want to make sure those resources are readily available so that even before the plan is developed or refined, have the phone number, have the resources to call, and have those experts available to you. And making sure that it's, it's not just about the vendor services. There's, there's a, you know, our clients are faced with hundreds of choices of vendors from a cyber insurance, cyber solution perspective. There's tons of them. But trying to weed out and really build strong relationships with those partners so that when those partners are working with our clients, that it's a transparent experience. We've always said we want our partners to treat our clients like a Chubb employee would treat their clients. And we, you know, working really hard to make sure that it's not just go talk to this vendor, go talk to this vendor and referring them, it's really working side by side with those vendors, whether it's for loss mitigation or for incident response, staying in lockstep with them. So you're really building response teams for any given incident. Yeah, and Russ, if I could, sure. sorry, Nick, just one quick thing to tack on to what Russ said in terms of how, from Chubb's perspective, incident response is a real priority. Um, I'll tie that back to how the DOD feels about this too. I mentioned that scoring rubric that the DOD has. Different controls are weighted depending on how either critical or foundational they are. And incident response, the vast majority of the controls in the incident response bucket get the highest weighting possible. So that's consistent with how the DOD feels that contractors should be prioritizing which controls to tackle first. That's absolutely right. Yep. Um, and also another another example that's really interesting is if you look at the CMMC requirements, you know, you scan through for, you know, in the first level one, I believe there's one for you know complex passwords. Absolutely critical control. We have a service to help our our customers get better at creating and maintaining secure passwords, but we've reprioritized. And we've said multi-factor authentication based on our incident data, based on our claim data, that's a really important control. If you look at CMMC, MFA is not first on their list right now. It's there. It's 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 pretty high up on their list, but it's not, you know, it's not number one. So it really is, you know, figuring out what those priorities are so that in the first, you know, two to three months, you have the, you know, even weeded down from the 17 getting down to the, the half a dozen controls that should be in place to create a really good foundation to build on these other areas that need to be expanded upon. 
So let's stay with that kind of good, better, best and, and um, move to the next question. And I'll just say really quickly, I understand from the um, organizer that my shared screen keeps going out. So apologize for the small technical difficulties. The good news is really all we're doing is putting the questions up on the screen just to keep everybody in task here. But um, let me go back to Trey here for this one. How does an under underwriter determine between a good, better and best? I mean, what is an underwriter looking for? or scrutinizing when determining the terms and conditions for a cyber insurance program. Thanks, Neil. Yes, and the first place to start is the is the application. That's kind of like the, the, the Bible of what we do as underwriters. You have to have the right applications to a small company, have, have a shorter application, a higher hazard operation. Um, we, we, we're going we're gonna to want to see more details. So we do have different applications for different sizes of companies. And uh, in an, an application, we'll get into operational controls, IS controls, privacy, contractual controls, and there'll be a section on on losses as well and different questions. So if, if you were insured and wanted to have excellent controls, ask for the longest application and look at all the favorable responses. And that's what you would have to have to have good controls. So uh, I'm definitely not an IT person, but uh, there are certain certain answers that do give me give me pause. We have to ask a little bit more. Next is a uh, an outside in scan. So we use a vendor called BitSight. And the scan for us is like a credit report if you're a, a bank loan officer. Uh, the score, good score, uh, I think it is 700 to 750 uh, overall. And we look at um, certain certain areas for uh, the, the reports go into a lot of detail, and and they'll 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 give us server identification numbers. We look at open ports. We look at SSL issues. And we look at patching cadence. Those are probably the three main areas. There's some other areas, and it gives us kind of an, an overall score. But uh, that's really important. And that tool can also be available to our policyholders. There are times that we'll, we'll, we'll uh, we, we don't try to be too rigid. There, there, there are certain servers that might not be connected to the rest of the network. They're used for, I don't know, word processing, not connected to secure DOD systems and such. We'll, we'll look at that, but we just need to see responses. As, as well. Um, and then lastly, um, well, got a couple more uh, sample contract, independent contractors, prime, sub, um, um, hosting companies as well. And then we use risk engineering uh, on, on some of our more complex risks. We, we have trained experts. We have a, a retired DOD uh, Army communications person that, that helps us, uh, particularly with cyber. So we'll have calls with our insureds to, uh, to address uh, key key issues, and uh, that's uh, that's it. Excellent. I'm going to come back to uh, to Kate. You know, we we talked about a lot of numbers and acronyms earlier. I do want to get back to 7021. Um, and really, for the folks that are attending this webinar, how should they respond if they see that requirement in either current solicitations or potentially modifications? Yeah, so the immediate reaction has got to be, this is a mistake. Um, as Neil, you preview, it's it's physically impossible to get CMMC certified right now. We've got C3PAOs out there who have been accredited, but they're not cleared yet to actually begin assessments. There are some administrative things and some guidance that we're still waiting on before they're going to be able to do so. Um, and so there's that sort of practical impediment to it that um, that your customer should understand. But there's also just the fact that per the interim rule that Neil was referencing, there's specific instructions to contracting officers on when they should be including 7021 in a solicitation. And the vast majority of solicitations should not include, well, I should say the default is that any solicitation should not include 7021 until we get to fiscal year 2026, when it will be required for all new solicitations, again, pending any review Visions that we see in the final rule. There are some exceptions where in the lead up to that 2026 rollout, the DOD will assess on a case by case basis, a small group of solicitations that will be issued in every year. Originally, we were thinking we were gonna have someone last year in fiscal year 2021. 
We haven't seen any yet, but the idea is, is that the DOD doesn't want this to be a bit of a shock to the system where all of a sudden every contractor is going to be subject to this. And so they're going to slowly at their discretion identify some solicitations and say, okay, in this group of solicitations, we're going to include 7021. We're only going to do 10 this year. Maybe there are 10 subcontractors we expect to be working under each of those 10 solicitations. So we've got 100 folks in the supply chain who are gonna be working with the C through POs to get certified. Then next year, maybe we'll bump it up to 25, the following year, maybe 100. And so that way they slowly start to build up the parts of the defense industrial base who are already comfortable with this. And along the way, they get to learn a bit about the process and kind of work out the kinks. But again, as Neil said, everything is so behind schedule we haven't seen a single solicitation take advantage of that discretion within acquisition and sustainment and include 7021 and i should also say that discretion is highly scrutinized there's a lot of public discussion around which programs were up for consideration to include that so this is all tbd we have seen in our experience lots of times where a solicitation, when it's in the draft stage, will have CMMC included, um, or where there's a modification issued um, on a current contract that tries to fold in CMMC. In those situations, um, in, at the solicitation stage, pointing out that issue in the Q&A process of kind of working through those draft solicitations that has always been successful, and kind of working through, again, from just a procedural standpoint, this shouldn't be included. And then from a practical standpoint, if you do include it, no one's gonna be able to bid because no one is gonna be able to get certified right now. And then for the modifications, going back and having a discussion with your customer, and we always frame this as, it's an educational discussion. It should not be adversarial. It's very much, hey, I see that you've got 7021 in here. Here's our understanding of why that's not appropriate. Can we talk through this to make sure we're on the same page? And in my experience, I've never seen the conversation end with 7021 staying in there. It always gets removed and the customer says, oops, so sorry, are bad. So that's, I would just highly, highly encourage proactive dialogue. Don't put your head in the sand and ignore it because it is happening. Um, the other thing I'd want to emphasize though is that there is a difference, and this particularly applies when you're talking about um, subcontractor, higher tier contractors to subcontractor relationships, there is the difference between asking a subcontractor to be CMMC certified and CMMC ready. So certified is a no-go, again, because the ecosystem just isn't there, but a higher tier contractor at their discretion can always decide to ask their subcontractors to represent that they are CMMC ready or provide the details around what their readiness posture is. We're seeing that happen a lot because higher tier contractors with really diverse supply chains, they're trying to understand what suppliers they can anticipate being able to rely on once CMMC does become a requirement and they're only allowed to work with subs who have been CMMC certified, they're trying to get a prioritized list to say, okay, this is the group of suppliers I feel pretty comfortable knowing that well into the future, I can keep working with them. I can keep asking them to handle CUI. This is the group of suppliers though that I'm a little unsure about and we might need to make alternative plans because we just might not be allowed to work with them in the future. So we are seeing the appropriate use of that sort of B2B discussions around being CMMC ready. But again, being CMMC certified, non-starter, absolutely open up a discussion early and often on that point. Definitely. Trey and Russ, you guys mentioned kind of the the impact that something like a um, September 11th or Katrina, like these large scale events, you know, kind of the ripple effect that they have in the industries in which we operate and, and certainly cyber is is in, in the prevalence of, of a cyber breach now um, being so high that it too is doing the same. And these are conversations that are had, you know, in every boardroom, this isn't an IT issue, you know, disaster recovery uh, and, and business continuity is not just an IT issue, it's an organizational issue and, and cyber would be the same. So when you think about kind of that ripple effect that, that can happen as a result of a breach, uh, beyond the cyber policy, what other insurance policies are relevant that, that could be triggered in the event of a breach? Yeah, ex excellent question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull from both uh, Russ and Nancy on this one. Um, I, and I can give some real examples as well. So I, I handle property, general liability, 
workers' compensation, umbrella liability, and Eno and cyber. So there are even other policies, but I'll, I'll give a couple examples. Russ, did you have any thoughts before before I get started? Yeah, just just real quick to to to, to add, it's the one of the things that's important is that, that we recognized a while ago is that there are other types of coverages that get impacted by the cyber event, which is one of the reasons why we decided earlier this year to open up all of the loss mitigation services to all Chubb insurance customers, because we we see the need and we see the risk, whether you have a cyber insurance policy or not, with Chubb opening up those services so that, you know, getting access to BitSight or getting access to these, these other solutions are available and because it, it is impacting other lines as as, as Trey will talk about. Yeah, that's that's great. So 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 oftentimes in, in, in our practice we'll we'll write the what we call the package of property and general liability, uh, the auto and, and the umbrella, but we might not write the the you know and the cyber. We we usually like to. Uh, and there's there's there are strong reasons to do so to combine them. Um, so what what we get into here is is when the physical world kind of meets the, the digital world and we, we call that silent cyber so you have a digital event and it can cause um property damage there's i'll give an example of of us uh, one of our brokers shared this with me with one of our customers an actual claim wasn't submitted there was coverage but sometimes i think that i get the impression that either contractors think it will be under the deductible they don't want to get people involved but in this scenario we had a skiff and our insured had a skiff there was a uh, extortion threat and a threat to uh, disable the door locks in the building so uh, um, i don't know if how it went down uh, but we never really heard anything from it from a claims perspective nothing was reported but but uh, there there that that could have definitely if it didn't play out in a, in a skip scenario or another scenario where, where systems are, are, are taken over. There was a, a, a well-publicized event, I think it was in 2014, where a German steel mill was hacked into, and it started with a spear phishing attack where targeted individuals were you know, gave up their passwords, got into the office system uh, of, of this steel mill in, in, in Germany. From there, they were looking into the process control systems, and they shut down a smelting plant. There was um, significant heat, uh, I believe a fire, and property damage that resulted. So there you have like a cross over and that's why it's really good to have the same insurance company across as many lines as you can uh errors and emissions and cyber often come up uh general liability uh, uh, comes up as well if there's property damage another example that the, this is a hypothetical that i'll give you with a lot of contractors that we work with with autonomous systems so let's say you have an autonomous uh, some of our companies are working on uh, mraps and uh, self-driving capabilities for different types of of, of uh, uh, assault vehicles. So if 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 the system fails, and then let's say in R&D testing mode, uh, property damage, bodily injury, and such, cyber policies aren't meant to cover that type of, of property damage. So uh, you have to look to to uh, uh, general liability policy, maybe products liability. You've got auto liability. Uh, all these things come into play. Uh, but there are other lines as well. Nancy, do you want to expand on other lines that you could look to for a cyber yeah. event for coverage? Yeah, thank you, Trey. This is Nancy Ahrens with Scott Insurance, and I don't want to step on Chubb's toes here, but a little history of um, of the cyber creation of this coverage. Remember the good old days when the bad actor was just looking for a little bit of cash from our businesses, um, whether it was an inside job like an embezzlement or, or an outside. But uh, the crime policy from the original origins, the history of your crime policy, actually back in the day, did cover a, a digital or an electronic type of loss, but because of it, because phishing and the cyber breaches have become, you know, a multi-billion dollar industry, the insurance industry has started muting, muting if you will, under your crime policy, um, some of the coverages. Uh, your better players like Chubb still do carry a fair amount of like your phishing type coverage or protection under your crime policy. And given how difficult the market is right now in cyber, and I get these calls weekly, folks. I mean, I get a call every week about some bad actor and sadly the client 
got duped. Okay, they they hit the wrong button. They entered a, a password and they lost their. They've lost some finance. They've had some financial loss. So the, I always recommend go to your crime policy first. Just knowing how difficult it is right now to even secure cyber protection and to secure and securing it at a reasonable cost. So your crime policy is one. Um, another interesting policy that can play into a very difficult uh, cyber claim could be potentially your DNO policy. Um, on top of all of the havoc that a breach can cause a company, then you can also get hit with fines and penalties. And uh, I've had a, I had one very horrific ransomware cyber breach where we were getting very close to hitting our limits of the policy limits. That's how large this cyber claim played out. And we then huddled with our DNO provider because we were fearful after the fact the client was going to get hit with fines and penalties and the directors and officers policy thankfully was going to be able to handle the fines and penalties um, so crime your dno i mean another interesting policy that can come into play in a difficult breach is your equipment breakdown or what they call your boiler policy uh, it's crazy how these breaches can actually wreak havoc to your HVAC systems, um, which is really more of a property play, if you will. And so you want to make sure that your property policy or your equipment breakdown coverages within your property portfolio is providing you some level of, if you will, breaching or hacking or cyber. Um, so those are three different policies that all can come into play when uh when this when bad actors hit you so i'll give that back to neil great thank you guys and i'm going to ask the panelists just in the interest of time we're going to rattle through these last few questions uh one is going back to kate does a third-party certification under cmmc eliminate risk under the false claims act yeah so quick one word response is somewhat um, so there is the benefit to having a third party certification model because you're no longer doing that self certification. The DOD is now taking the word of the C3PAO and the accreditation body that accredited that assessor, not the contractors. So from that perspective, there is a mitigation of risk. Um, and I should say, we know that false claims act risks are top of mind for contractors in particular in response to just earlier this week, the DOJ, DOJ announced a civil cyber fraud initiative, basically saying we're, we're, we don't have the patience left anymore. And to the extent that you're not meeting these obligations and you're getting paid for having met these obligations, there are going to be some significant consequences to that. Um, so in many ways, the CMMC model is something that a lot of contractors, despite the challenges associated with it, from a false claims at risk perspective, they welcome this because it does mitigate that risk somewhat. But I would say that there are two outstanding questions that leave the question of what FCA risk remains still left unanswered. Um, the first is that there's been a lot of discussion within the CMMC model about this concept of continuous monitoring, the idea that you get certified and then three years later you're going to have to get recertified, but what happens in the intervening three years and who has the obligation to alert either the DOD or the C3PAO that perhaps the contractor's environment or their security posture looks so significantly different from when it was assessed that actually there needs to be a reassessment or perhaps an acceptance of the fact that you're actually no longer in compliance with what the certificate requires. So there's that question as well, whether or not that will be an affirmative obligation on the contractor to come forward, raise their hand, say, oh, I think I have a problem. That's one potential area of exposure. The other is that individual contracts may still require more than what the included CMMC certificate level had. And I say that in the sense that CMMC might still be the floor. Individual contracts might say, okay, for example, we said that you need to meet CMMC level three, present us our certificate showing that you meet that level. 
but there are a handful of controls from level four that we also think that you need to do based on the specifics of this contract. That's not all of the level four controls. So we're not gonna ask you to prevent a level four certificate, but because your certificate doesn't touch on any of those level four controls, again, that's left to you to do a self-certification unless the DOD wants to approach some sort of other formal audit mechanism. So again, lower FCA risk, but not eliminated altogether and still lots of question marks there. Great, thanks Kate. Uh, let me go to Trey on this last question. We're gonna stay with certification um, here for a second, Trey. And how will the actual certification be perceived by the insurance industry uh, with respects to whether or not they are basically being perceived as having better operations? Yeah, so, so now at this point, Chubb, Chubb is asking if companies are CMMC ready. We may not be using the appropriate term, but thanks, th thanks to Kate, we can, we can ask for that. We always ask for your process, especially in uh, risk engineering calls or uh, with emails to the side. So our applications do not ask for that now. And we are one, if not the only company that I know of that has a federal government contracting practice that does cyber insurance. So I can say it's safe to, safe to bet that that uh, some of the other cyber insurers won't know what CMMC is. Uh, however, the the, uh, the the controls that are in indicated on the application will give some reflection. Uh, going down the road, I see that questions being added to the applications. Like right now, we ask if the certifications like ISO 27001 are being met, and I see CMMC added to that down the road. Great. Right. Well, thank you guys. I'm going to skip over this last question just in the interest of time and kind of jump to a quick look ahead in these last few minutes. So you've heard several different things today. Again, when we looked at the, the title of is it required, I think the answer, um, I'm going to use a, a page out of Kate's playbook of, uh, kind of a lawyer response, sorry, Kate, of, of some letter to be determined. I do think it is going to be required. I don't think that is going to be outright replaced anytime soon. Now, whether it's modified uh, as a result of the final rule, absolutely, I think there's some changes uh, still to come. And some of the things that people are talking about is whether or not it will return back to kind of a modified 7012 approach, whether or not it's replaced with another certification. You heard Trey just mentioned ISO 27001, uh, which is an international standard. Um, and then if you think about this kind of impact to timeline, We've talked several times, and, and Kate made mention of this, that there are four level three uh, C3PO's. These are the certifying bodies that are required to be certified themselves in order to then turn around and conduct certifications of, um, you know, the, the government contractors uh, that have been certified by the DOD's audit arm, DIVCAC. But as of today, they still cannot perform assessments. Um, that is due, in fact, to a, the, the rule is not final, and B, the assessment guides have, have not been issued. Um, whether or not it's going to be branded as CMMC, whether or not there's going to be an a, uh, agency agnostic um, uh, requirement in, in the years to come, the fact of the matter is, and you've heard it from the insurance side, you've heard it from the legal side, and you'll hear it from my side as well, folks should not be sticking their, their head in the sand. Um, as Kate mentioned earlier, just because the requirement will be 2026, there's a lot of work not only to be done prior to 2026, but there will also be contracts increasing year over year with that five-year uh, rollout. So uh, this isn't something that most organizations can flip a few switches and meet the requirements. This is something that you know requires a significant uh, investment in time, energy resources, and quite frankly, sometimes money. Uh, and should be planned for as such. Uh, you heard earlier about talking to your supply chain up or down. Uh, if you are a prime, by all means, reaching out to subs that you've worked with or maybe anticipate working with um, to see what they are doing about CMMC, nothing wrong with that. And quite frankly, if you are heavily dependent on a specific prime or, or one or two primes um, for your paychecks at the end of the day, uh, nothing wrong with you kind of reaching uh, uh, upwards and reaching out to those folks above you at the prime level to check in to see what their expectations are. Uh, because as I mentioned, uh, this is a, a process uh, that, that takes uh, quite a long time to, to meet. Um, if you look kind of down at the bottom, uh, you know, continue monitoring the news. Don't pay attention to just the salacious articles, although they are good to know and read about. There is a lot of information out there. 
um, some of it good, um, and there will be information in the coming months about the rule going final impacts to small and medium businesses that many of you uh, on this seminar should be aware of. Um, in the meantime, certainly with any new rollout of a program comes, you know, kind of the snake oil salesmen that are out there saying they can get you certified overnight, saying that they can train your folks overnight. That's just not the case. If you go right to the AB's website, they have kind of a call out box pretty much saying the exact same thing. Um, but taking a look at assessing your company, getting smart on what the program means to you as an organization and your role in the DIB um, and, and figuring out how you want to approach it and actually taking time to plan for it. This presentation today was really refreshing for me. Normally, I'm presenting you know, on how to prepare and what to do and what not to do and what to look out for and key takeaways and uh, key pitfalls to avoid and so forth. But this was great for me to kind of step back and, and listen to the other aspect, not necessarily the audit and readiness side or the assertion and certification side, but listen to uh, the legal and, um, and insurance side. Uh, with that said, I want to thank the panelists. Uh, we're going to leave up the contact information here for a little bit. I think we touched on a lot of different things from those different angles and certainly consider us resources going forward. Reach out with any questions. Um, we see some in the chat that we'll follow up with, but we do appreciate everybody attending today. And if you have questions, whether it be on the insurance side, the legal side, the assessment side, we want to ping all three of us purely for um, you know our opinions on certain things. By all means, feel free to consider us a resource and use those uh, use those emails. And last but not least, and we'll send these out afterwards as well. I wanted to leave you with a couple of different resources. Um, the AB's website, which is listed first, is great. Um, has some great kind of roadmaps to think about, some estimates of time, some kind of meet uh, key milestones for organizations to consider. Uh, I mentioned Project Spectrum earlier for small and medium businesses that's been set up by the DOD, also contains a lot of valuable information. And then each one of our organizations re represented on the panel today have um, uh, resources for you on our websites. Uh, I think Trey mentioned the, the, Chub, the Cyber Index there. Um, on our site, the, the Cherry Beckert site, you can literally just search CMMC. We've got a podcast series. We have uh, previous recordings of, of presentations uh, helping you prepare deep diving into the actual framework and so forth. Um, and then uh, Kroll as well also has uh, specific resources on the link provided. So with that said, I think we only went just a few seconds older, uh, over, excuse me. I want to once again thank the uh, sponsor as well as the panelists today. And we hope everyone uh, enjoys the rest of their week and please do not hesitate to reach out with any questions. Thanks so much.